and welcome. We are in Senior English B, and uh, we're going to now spend a few minutes with Penelope Lively's text, Next Term Will Mash You. You ought to have your hymnals open right now to page 1434, and uh, I just want to make a couple of quick observations for your annotations. Make sure you get this written down. Under literary analysis, I want you to be sure that you understand the difference between direct characterization and indirect characterization. Okay, this is going to be significant in this story. You want to make sure. So you can come right out and say things, or you can suggest things, and that's what you want to write down with this indirect. Suggest things about a person or a character, okay, instead of coming right out and saying something about the character. Of course, we also want to take care of theme, a topic about which we have spoken regularly. The other thing I'd point out is the vocabulary down at the bottom of the page. All six of those words will probably end up on the examination. So you want to make sure that you know those words in preparation for the examination, all right? Let's now turn to the text itself on 1436. Penelope Lively, very, very important British author, is going to now give us a story about a young man who is preparing to go to private boarding school. Now, this is a very, one of the reasons I have you read this story is because this is very, very unusual. Imagine for a moment if at your sixth grade year, okay, your parents had flown you to California, had driven you to a school where you lived at the school. You don't leave it. You live at the school. And your parents would have said in sixth grade, we will see you at Christmas time. Okay? We will see you at Christmas time. And they kiss you goodbye. And then they just get in a car and drive back to the airport. And there you are. And you go to school there. All right? That's boarding school. Now, in England, just like in America, but even more in England, we have very, very elite boarding schools. Go ahead and read with me the background information on 1436. For centuries, the British upper class, rich or poor, very rich, the British upper class has sent its sons to exclusive private schools known in Britain as, this is important for your exam, public schools. In America, we call what you're in public schools, and we call boarding schools private schools. But in England, a private school for us is what they call public schools. Okay, so you want to write that down in your notes so that you remember it. Like, of course, the most famous of all of the British uh, public schools uh, for top students, Eton, of course, Harrow, Win uh, Westminster, followed by study at one of Britain's two most prestigious universities. The goal, if you are British, is to go to one of the top two institutions of higher learning in England, either Oxford or Cambridge. They are, in England, what we think of as Harvard and Stanford and Yale in the United States. All right? Very, very competitive, very difficult to get in. So exclusive, read it with me, are these public schools that a family expecting to send a son to one often puts him down on a future attendance list at birth. So the kid is born, and literally the same month the kid is born, you go in and put the kid's name down on a waiting list to start him in boarding school. So competitive, so expensive. You drop serious bank to send your son to one of these schools. Why would any parent do that? Write it down. Why would any parent want to do that? What would be the point of sending your boy away to a public school, to a, what we would call private school, to a boarding school? What would be the point of that? Why would any parent want to spend so much money? Of course, it's real simple. You spend money so that someday the kid can yeah. make money. You got it. That's it. It's that simple. It's economics, isn't it? It's not just economics, though. It's also about power and prestige, isn't it? In other words, if you can say that you've been to one of these schools, right, you have a certain kind of power, right? You have a certain kind of ability or power. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. So let's talk it through here real quickly, all right? In this story, we're going to have... A, we're going to have a young man who is going to, ostensibly with his family, trying out the school. All right, trying out the school, and and this is kind of now where we are. All right, let's take a look at it. Inside the car, it was quiet. The noise of the engine even and subdued the air, just the right temperature. The windows tight fitting. The boy sat on the back seat, a box of chocolates and open beside him, in a comic that folded. The trim Sussex landscape flowed past the windows, cows, white fenced fields, highly priced period houses. The sunlight was glassy, remote as a colored photograph. The backs of the two heads in front of him swayed with the motion of the car. 
His mother half turned to speak to him. Nearly there now, darling. The father glanced downwards at his wife's wrist. Are we all right for time? Just right, nearly twelve. I could do with a drink. Hope they lay something on. I'm sure they will. The Wilcoxes say they're awfully nice people. Not really the schoolmaster type at all, Sally says. The man said, he's an Oxford chap. Is he? You didn't say. Hmm. Of course, the fees are much higher than the Seaford place. Fifty quid or so. We'll have to see. The car turned right between white gates and a high, dark, tight-clipped hedges. The whisper of the road under the tires changed to the crunch of gravel. The child, staring sideways, red black lettering on a whiteboard, St. Edward's Preparatory School, please drive slowly. He shifted on the seat. The leather sucked at the bare skin under his knees, stinging. The mother said, it's a lovely place. Those must be the playing fields. Look, darling, here are some of the boys. She clicked open her handbag, and the sun caught her mirror and flashed in the child's eyes. The comb went through her hair, and he saw the grooves it left, neat as distant plowing. Come on then, Charles, get out. Or out you get. The building was red brick, nearly 19th century, spreading out long arms in which windows glittered blackly, flowers trapped in neat beds, where alternate red and white. They went up the steps, the man and the woman, and the child two paces behind. What do you like about the verb trap? Jot down in your annotations what you like about the flowers trapped in neat, in neat beds, flower beds. What's nice about the word trapped? Once the kids show up, yeah, they're trapped, aren't they? They're stuck there. Normally, by the way, these schools are set outside of London, outside the city, out in an area that's fairly isolated. So in other words, when the kids get there, there's no, there's no easy way for them to have many distractions other than the schooling itself. The woman, the mother, smoothing out a skirt that would be ridged from sitting thought, I like the way they've got the maid all done up properly. The little white apron and all that, she's foreign, I suppose, au pair. Very nice. If he comes here, there'll be speech days and that kind of thing. Sally Wilcox says it's quite dressy. She got that cream linen coat for coming down here. You can see why it costs a bomb. Great big grounds and only an hour and a half from London. They went into a room looking out into a terrace beyond dappled lawns, gently shifting trees, black and white cows grazing behind iron railings, books, leather chairs, a table with magazines, country life, the field, or the economist. Please, if you would write here, the headmaster won't be long. What is a headmaster? Write that down. What do you imagine the headmaster is? What would we call the headmaster? The we would call him the principal, that's right, or the superintendent of school, that's right. Alone, they sat, inspected. I like the atmosphere, don't you, John? Very pleasant, yes. 400 a term, near enough. You can tell it's a cut above the Seaford place, though, or the one at St. Albans. Bob Wilcox says quite a few city people send their boys here. One or two of the merchant bankers, those kind of people. It's the sort of contact that would do no harm at all. You meet someone, get talking at a cricket match, or what have you. Not at all a bad thing. What's a cricket match? Their form, of, their form of baseball. You got it. Their form of baseball. All right, Charles, you didn't get sick in the car, did you? The child had black hair. By the way, has Charles said a word in this story? Mm -hmm. Not a word, has he? It's important for your notes. Black hair slicked down smooth to his head, his ears too large, jutted out, transparent in the light from the window, laced with tiny, delicate veins. His clothes had the shine and crease of newness. He looked at the books, the dark brown pictures. His parents said nothing. Come here, let me tidy your hair. The door opened. The child hesitated, stood up, sat, then rose again with his father. Mr. and Mrs. Manders? How very nice to meet you. I'm Margaret Spokes. And will you please forgive my husband who is tied up with some wretch who broke the cricket pavilion window and will be just a few more minutes. We try to be organized, but a schoolmaster's day is always just that bit unpredictable. Do please sit down, and what will you have to revive you after that beastly drive? You live in Finchley, is that right? Hampstead, really, said the mother. Sherry would be lovely. She worked over the headmistress' wife from shoes to hairstyle, pricing and assessing. Jot down in your notes, what does it mean when the mother looks at the headmistress and prices and assesses as she looks over her from head to foot? What does that mean? She's not just looking at her, she's pricing and assessing her means what? <coughs> she's looking at how she's dressed to understand what? Right, that's right, her social status, right? Her social status. Notice, shoes, old but expensive, Russell and Bromley. Good skirt, blouse, could be Marks and Sparks, not sure. 
real pearls, super Victorian ring. She's not gone to any particular trouble, that's just what she'd wear anyway. You can be confident with a voice like that, of course. Sally Wilcox says she knows all sorts of people. Who are the Wilcoxes? Do you get a sense? Mm -hmm. Wilcoxes are very wealthy people who speak highly of this preparatory school and are going to suggest that Charles then find his way there. The headmaster's wife said, I don't know how much you know about us. Prospectuses don't tell you a thing, do they? We'll look around everything in a minute when you've had a chat with my husband. I gather you're friends of the Wilcoxes, by the way. I'm awfully fond of Simon. He's down for uh, Winchester, of course, but I expect you know that. Her mother <coughs> smiled over her sherry. Oh, I know that all right. Sally Wilcox doesn't let you forget that. And this is Charles? My dear, we've been forgetting all about you. It's an important line. What's significant about that line, we've been forgetting all about you? Yeah, in other words, this, this is a negotiation between who? Between adults. It's got nothing to do with the kid. Or does it? Right? Or does it? In a minute, I'm going to borrow Charles and take him off to meet some of the boys, because after all, you're choosing a school for him, aren't you, and not for you. So, you ought, so he ought to know what he might be letting himself in for, and it shows we've got nothing to hide. It's interesting that you would say, we're obviously choosing the school, not for you, the parents, but for the kid. Is that completely true? Why is that not completely true? Right, a lot of this does have to do with choosing for the parent, doesn't it? The parents laughed. The father, Sherry warming his guts, thought that this was an amusing woman, not attractive, of course, a bit homespun, but impressive all the same. Partly the voice, of course. It takes a bloody expensive education to produce a voice like that. And other things, of course, background and all that stuff. In other words, you go to preparatory school to learn how to speak correctly. In other words, you can tell in England where an individual has been educated by the way he speaks the language of English. Okay? In other words, you're going to be taught a certain kind of way of speaking. I think I can hear the thud of the fourth form coming in from games, which means my husband's on his way, and then I shall leave you with him while I take Charles off to the common room. Common room, we call it the commons area, right? For a moment, the three adults centered on the child, looking, judging. The mother said, he looks so hideously pale compared to those boys we saw outside. My dear, that's London, isn't it? You just have to get them out to get them some color into them. Ah, here's James. James, Mr. and Mrs. Manders. You remember Bob Wilcox was mentioning at Sports Day. The headmaster reflected his wife's style like paired cards in Happy Families. His clothes were mature rather than old, his skin well scrubbed, his shoes clean, his, ge his geniality untainted by the least condensation. He was genuinely sorry to have kept them waiting, but in this business one lurches from one window of minor crisis to the next. And this is Charles? Hello there, Charles. Notice they all talk to him, but does Charles ever speak? Not a word, right? Not a word. His large head rested for a moment on the child his large hand rested for a moment on the child's head, quite extinguishing the thin dark hair. It was as though he had but to clench his fist to crush the skull. But he took his hand away and moved the parents to the window to observe the mutilated cricket pavilion with indulgent laughter. And the child is born away. Up oh, for your notes. Note the shift in tense. Do you see it? We've been working in what tense up to this moment? Past tense, right? Notice the child is born is what tense? Present tense. We move from past tense now to present tense. Watch this one. And the child is born away by the headmaster's wife. She never touches him or tells him to come, but simply here bears him away like some relentless tide down corridors and through swinging glass doors, towing him like a frail craft, not bothering to look back to see if he's following, confident in the strength of magnetism or obedience, and delivers him to a room where boys are scattered among inky tables and rungless chairs and sprawled on a mangy carpet. There's a scampering and a rising and a silence falling as she opens the door. Now this is the lower third, Charles, who you'd be with if you come to us in September. Boys, this is Charles Manders, and I want you to tell him all about things and answer any questions he wants to ask. You can believe about half of what they say, Charles, and they will tell you the most fearful lies about the food, which is excellent. The boys laugh and groan, amiable, exaggerated groans. They must like the headmaster's wife. There is licensed repartee. They look at her with bright eyes and open, eager faces. Someone leaps to hold the door for her and close it behind. She is gone. So put in your notes. Where, what are we at now? The boy is where? What's he doing now? He is standing among all of his potential classmates 
who he will be with come next fall when his parents decide to bring him to this school, right? How's this going to go? Can you predict how is this going to go? The child stands in the center of the room. And it draws in around him. Notice the brilliant way that Lively creates tension in this passage. The circle of children contacts. Faces are only a yard or so from him. Strange faces. Looking. Assessing. Notice this is the second time the word assessing has been used. What does that word mean? If you look at someone and assess them, what does that mean? You not only are looking at them physically, but you're trying to what? You're trying to do something about them. You've got to try to figure something out about them. What, you know, what, who are they? What are they really like? Asking questions. They help themselves to his name, his age, his school. Over their heads, he sees beyond the window an inaccessible world of shivering trees and high racing clouds. And his voice, which has floated like a feather in the dusty schoolroom air, dies altogether and he becomes mute. And he stands in the middle of them with shoulders humped, staring down at feet, grubby plimsolls and kicked brown sandals. There is a noise in his ears like rushing water, a torrential din, out of which voices boom, blotting each other out so that he cannot always hear the words. Do you? They say. And have you? And what's your? And the faces. If he looks up, swing into one another in kaleidoscopic patterns, and the floor under his feet is unsteady, lifting and falling. And out of the noises comes one voice that is complete, that he can hear. Next turn, we'll mash you, it says. We always mash new boys. And a bell goes. Somewhere beyond doors and down corridors, and suddenly the children are all gone, clattering away and leaving him there with the heaving floor and the walls that shift and swing. And the headmaster's wife comes back and tows him away, and he's with his parents again, and they're getting into the car, and the high hedges skim past the car windows once more in the other direction, and the gravel under the tires changes to black tarmac. Well... I liked it, didn't you? The mother adjusted the car around her, closing windows, shrugging up into her seat. Very pleasant, really. Nice chat. Who answers? Who answers? Who says this? Very pleasant, really. Who says that? Yes, yeah, the father, isn't it? I liked it. Not quite so sure about her. It's pricey, of course. What's pricey? The school is going to cost a lot of money to go. All the same, money well spent, though. One way and another. Shall we settle it then? I think so. I'll drop him a line. What's the decision? Yeah, we're going to do it. Great, great. We'll send him there. We'll send him. Who has not yet spoken in this story? The kiddo who's actually going to go there. The mother pitched her voice a notch higher to speak to the child in the back of the car. Would you like to go there, Charles? Like Simon Wilcox. Did you see that lovely gym and the swimming pool? And did the other boys tell you all about it? The child does not answer. He looks straight ahead of him at the road coiling beneath the bonnet of the car's face. is haggard with anticipation. What does that mean to you? Haggard with anticipation. He's worried? What do you imagine he's worried about? What does he know is coming? What does it mean, we'll mash you? You think it's a physical beating up? What else could it be? Yeah, they're going to introduce him to the school. They're going to humiliate him. What is that called? Initiation, hazing, right? Hazing. Welcome to the welcome to the program. Now we're going to now we're going to make you understand the program. Next term, we'll mash you. Uh, jot down in your notes really quickly at 2A, what is, what, what is the major theme of a story like this in terms of what you think this story is actually saying? What is this story actually saying? I mean, this is an interesting story for American kids to read because you learn something about British public boarding school, but what exactly is the theme of a story like this, do you imagine? You really don't have a say. Who doesn't have a say? Child, child, Charles here does, doesn't have much of a say, does he? Why doesn't he just speak up and say, yeah, this place looks like it sucks, I don't want to go? His parents like it. It's their money. He doesn't have a choice. He will be trapped for how long, do you imagine? Why? Who said, who said forever? Why forever? 
You're right. Why is he trapped forever? What do you know about his father? Where did his father go to school? Very similar kind of schooling, right? In other words, this is that economic circle that just happens over and over and over again. No exit, right? Good or a bad idea? Is it a good idea to put kids in a situation where they have to man up? Where they have to survive? Even if they get, even if they get mashed? Yes. How hard is it, do you think, to go to a new school? How hard is it to leave and go into a new place? See, we got one or two of us in our class who have had this experience. See, some of us have never had this experience, really, because we grew up in the same town. So we've yet to really experience what it's like to show up and know absolutely nobody. What's that going to be for some of us? For some of us, that might be going to college, right? That, for some of us, that might be going to university, right? What is it like to do that project, right? What is it like to do that project? That is to say... A little bit, a little bit uncertain maybe about how that one all shakes down, right? Um, how will you survive? What's the hardest thing about going to a new school where you don't know anybody? How about it, Johnson? What's the hardest thing? Uh, how you'll look towards others, how others will think of you. Yeah, assessing. assessing. Everyone's assessing. New student assessing the all the people at the school, all the people at the school assessing new student, right? All right, there you go. Penelope Lively's text, right? Yeah.